extraordinary historian. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, okay, let me start by saying, I guess uh, Stephen Reynolds and Tim O'Phelan are going to wait until after I make some remarks that will take about 15 minutes, and they have like five or ten minutes. Is that the length yeah, you think? Yeah, ten minutes. Stephen Reynolds, you might recognize from uh, Channel 9, and uh, Tim O'Phelan has, what, over 30 years' experience as an editor, uh, with, uh, and he's done professional work with television, so they'll be very interesting to uh, present what they're going to talk about today. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay, um, now I sit usually, I came the first time about a year and a half ago, and I usually sit over at the table in the corner there, which is a lot of fun. And my, my ambition is to actually make it over to this table and meet these people because after a year and a half, I still haven't met everybody. So <clears throat> I'll just talk about <clears throat> briefly about uh, who I am for the people that uh, <clears throat> haven't met me. Um, my dad was an aviation cadet. Uh, he was a <clears throat> B-29 flight engineer in the school at Amarillo, Texas. And then uh, I believe he was uh, in the advanced uh, cruise control school at Hondo briefly before the, the bomb was dropped and the uh, the war ended. And that was about the same time I think Bob was there at Hondo. So uh, anyway, it's a small world. But uh, he always told me that he thought, or everybody thought, I guess, that the war was going to last uh, longer than it actually did. When the uh, bomb was dropped, uh, that seemed to shorten things up. And uh, if Truman hadn't done that, I possibly might not be standing here talking to you. Um, anyway, Vince asked me to talk about uh, our ongoing archives, video, and web projects, some of which have been funded by the Minnesota Legacy uh, Grant Program. <clears throat> what I've been doing is uh, I've been converting uh, VHS tapes of uh, 53 past presentations, which were, were recorded from 2001 to 2003 by Dick Gill, uh, into our digital archives. And I think he's created a great permanent legacy when he did that. Um, I've also been trying to record the group's presentations in the current series, which recently went over 50 presentations. I've also been uh, recording our school outreach programs, which uh, are excellent. Those kids are really, I hope they appreciate what they're, what they're getting with uh, Bob and uh, Jim and Vince. Um, and we've been putting those on DVD so that they're there for the future. They're up on our website. Uh, some of them have been accessed over 100 times. Uh, it's both for, for preservation of what they have to say and ease of access for the students and the teachers who are, are the ultimate end users. I've also recorded two extended oral history interviews uh, so far. And I'd like to do four more in the near future if people uh, are interested in doing that. Uh, some people maybe don't want to give a presentation or they don't want to stand up for the length of period of time for that. Now, uh, last count, there's over 132 DVDs and audio CDs preserved in the digital archives, which is over here. Everything fits into this uh, <clears throat> thing. This is just full of DVDs. In fact, I'm going to have to buy another one uh, soon. And uh, with new technology, you can actually shrink that down to something that's like a credit card size. Um, so if you have any old photos or films, uh, VHS tapes, uh, old DVDs or CDs or cassette tapes uh, stored in your attic or in the basement uh, that you think would be of interest, we're set up not easily make copies. So um, we can return the originals with a copy to you within a week. And for example, Mike Madsen, who's, a, who's on a Navy destroyer as an electrician, sits over there, um, has brought in over eight hours of uh, historic VHS video, which includes the Plains of Fame symposia, such as the Medal of uh, Honor and the Corsair Veterans uh, panel. And uh, this is uh, stuff that, you know, at this point it's going to be come back because Plains of Fame uh, is gone. So uh, if you have anything like that, we can certainly make a copy for you. Uh, I've also received from three different people their interviews by. Al Malmberg on WCCO Radio, which I think were just excellent because he knew a lot about the subject matter on uh, WCCO's World of Aviation. Um, many of you have been interviewed for different history groups and reporters for uh, these short biographical broadcast TV segments uh, over the years. 
often for Veterans Day or Memorial Day uh, or for air shows and so forth. So we're interested in archiving all of that. And I'd like to see a permanent archives of our old newsletters. And I'd like to offer a free digital backup copy service for the important old photographs, letters, and any documents uh, like discharge papers or maps that you need a copy made of. Now, speaking personally, I just cringe because I hear story after story about boxes of old World War II correspondence and photographs and so forth uh, that are being lost in fires, moves, they're thrown out, usually by the wife or the youngest daughter, when the house is clean. So um, I can go on and on about that because people tell me about that all the time. Uh, but we want to preserve that stuff. It's primary source material. Um, and the government learned the hard way, as many of you know, in the 1970s, when most of the military service records from World War I and World War II were destroyed in a fire. So the copying and dispersal of records is really a key <clears throat> for the strategy of long-term preservation. Now, with a modern digital camera, you can make a copy with the press of a button. And uh, Robert Pettijohn at one time brought in some really nice photographs he had of himself at the Las Vegas Gunnery School. And uh, copying the photos took maybe a minute or two. Because basically, we just set them out on a table. I took a photo of the photos. I gave them back to him. And they were up and permanently stored and easily accessible to his family on uh, the his presentation's web page. <clears throat> Now, when Dick uh, Hill recorded 53 presentations, uh, he really created a permanent legacy for the future. Most of those videos are now up on our presentations website, and perhaps the majority of the people recorded then are now gone. Now, the wives, children, and grandchildren who have been accessing those videos on the website are all very appreciative. Uh, for example, the video of Ted Murphy, when he was 10 years younger, much before I knew him, uh, originally, and telling funny stories about his time in the service, and the video of him flying uh, the Stearman at Plains of Fame with Steve Hinton have been viewed by his wife and his children and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren, who now are spread all over uh, the country. Now, we've just completed another 50 presentations in the Before It's Too Late series, uh, begun in 2009 by uh, Vince Parker and Bob Clemens, and I don't know, Dick, did you? Were you involved with that? Okay. Well, looking at the big picture, uh, what I wanted to talk about is the role of historical societies uh, generally in the preservation and writing of history, uh, which overlaps, but it's a little different uh, than biography. Uh, in terms of my educational background, I, my undergraduate degree was in history, which was enough to make me realize I don't know a lot about it. It's just such an enormous subject. And in studying World War II, I had Harold Deutsch uh, who created that, that course. So um, you, you, you learn things at the general's level and you learn things at the individual level. And at the end of it, you realize that the mind probably cannot comprehend the totality of World War II because of the statistics of what was going on. Um, I've also uh, got a Juris Doctor degree in law master's degree in anthropology from the University of Minnesota. Uh, a little bit about my background, I worked as a trial lawyer, an English composition instructor, and an anthropology instructor at the University of Minnesota. And I'm also a web designer. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Now over the years, I know our veterans have been exposed to at least four different types of interviews and four different types of video end products. Uh, the first is the oral history interview, which is what I do and what historians tend to do. Uh, the second is the broadcast journalist uh, who produces often a brief human interest TV segment. Uh, it's often with a patriotic theme, uh, maybe because of a holiday um, or an air show that's going on. And we've probably seen about six to ten of those a year on, if you watch local television. And I told Stephanie he's going to have to take a few dings like I do for being a lawyer because he's in broadcast television today. I've got a um, thick skin. He's got a thick skin, he says. Uh, the third uh, type is the historical documentary filmmaker. Uh, John Sermon has attempted to do that with our group. And fourth is the one-hour cable TV <coughs> interviewer who, uh, following the broadcast, posts their interview up on the web. And we saw an exemplar of that with Larry Bachman. And that web 
inter that, in that interview is up on the website. So it's there forever. It's there as long as there's uh, money going towards the web hosting uh, source there, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, so although they use the same methods and techniques, uh, the editing style and the standards, the length, the goals, and the historical value of their final work products can be quite different. Now the goal of oral history interviews is to, or the ideal, is to preserve an extended comprehensive uh, biographical and historical interview on video, along with digital copies of any important photos and documents, such as correspondence or a lot of people have pilot and mission lists or logs, crew lists, maps, written orders with dates on them. Um, and these interviews are intended as sort of a comprehensive visual biography. And usually at several points in the interview, they tell historians something new about history and that period of time. Uh, the stories, photos, and documents are usually all new and previously unseen by historians. Now visually, they're very much uh, slower paced. Uh, they're methodical and kind of dull compared to the other genres, which I'll talk about. Uh, but their main audience is the general public. And an oral history interviewer will often arrive at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon and doesn't get out of there until 5 o'clock because of all the stories and they're so interesting. So I've done several of these. I've talked to other oral historians. And uh, uh, they all have the same experience, which is there's a lot. You guys are all walking encyclopedias. And it takes a while to actually record the types of things that, are, that you know that are uh, unique and, and new to history. Um, from the, that basic work, you can then edit segments or documentary uh, work later, as time permits. Um, the oral history interview is mainly what historical societies tend to do, uh, since it focuses on recording primary sources with something new to say about uh, historical questions and the historical period. Um, and that's the work product that MHS, or the Minnesota Historical Society, usually gives grants for. Now the goals and values of broadcast uh, TV are sometimes quite different because they're heavily formatted, they're fast paced, uh, they're maybe three and a half to four minutes, they're highly edited, they're, they're narrated, um, and they're basically filling a role for a human interest segment, um, which is designed to be very visually interesting and often it has a lot of interjected footage. Um, I guess my pet peeve is I keep seeing the same footage, and it may or may not have anything to do with the guy that they're talking about. So I don't know how many times I've seen that. I think it's an orchard uh, that's being bombed, and I always think, well, boy, didn't they miss the target? You know, and I, I must see this six times a year on television uh, when they do these things. So um, I've seen the long airplane associated with the person who's the the pilot. So, from the point of view of a historian, they're kind of, or they can be a jumble, and they're not. There's no citation, so you don't know where the footage came from and how it relates necessarily to the uh, the person that was the veteran. But they're they're a lot of fun. I, I always enjoy seeing those. Um, it's just that um, you know it's uplifting and it's interesting, and it's got a patriotic theme, but it has some limited historical usefulness to to historians. And I've never seen the Historical Society fund one. The third type is the historical documentary filmmaker uh, who tries to say something new about history and usually focuses on a topic or a theme. So they often have multiple interviewees. And we saw some of that last weekend. We had, uh, Thomas Saylor, who's the local historian at Concordia, interviewed Joe Gomer and Liz Strobus. Uh, and there have been others recently. Um, and they try to do this in a visually interesting way. But the production and the big budgets associated with financing uh, TV productions can be quite daunting. Uh, it can be an all or no, nothing kind of multi-year project. And sometimes they never get on television. Uh, and the footage eventually just gets stored away. And nobody ever sees it because of copyright issues. Uh, so the fourth type is the cable TV recorder doing a one-hour interview with the veteran in a shorter uh, variation of the oral history interview. And after it's broadcast, it's usually available on the web or in the public uh, domain. Um, and uh, so there's a continuum of lengths, editing styles, viewability, and content. 
And we need to keep in mind that there's a term that's used by historians, but also other disciplines, called the primary source. And it has a slightly different meaning depending on the, the uh, discipline that's, that's using it. In history, it's used to describe the source of material closest to the period uh, being studied. So a primary source can be a person with direct knowledge of historical events or a photograph or document from the time, uh, personal letters, records, and reports. Uh, primary sources that provide new information about the period or untold stories are of great value. In fact, that's held at the highest value. Now, a secondary source comments upon or is a secondhand piece of information about a historical period sometimes by people who weren't necessarily there. Uh, and the reason for the distinction is that eyewitness accounts are thought to be more reliable than secondhand hearsay, commentary, or narration, which sometimes it has later biases or agendas involved. So the objective of classifying the sources is to try to determine the independence and the reliability of the source. So the historian prefers to go back to primary sources and wants to see new ones, because whether they're accurate or not, they give new input into historical questions. Most modern history revolves around the heavy use of archives maintained by historical societies for the purpose of finding useful primary sources. From the point of view of the historian, many of the people in this room are the last primary sources about World War II who can still provide new information. And as Vince is always correctly pointing out, the veterans' presentations are first person, they're authentic, and they need to be uh, recorded, as he would say, before it's too late. And I was uh, reminded of the great depth and wealth of information of the people in the room. Uh, now, I wasn't born until 54, so that's uh, some nine years after the end of the war. But I recently gave Vince a copy of the color 8mm home movie, which was made by someone in the 301st Bomb Group 32nd Squadron, <clears throat> which he'd never seen and I'd never seen. It was just posted last year on YouTube. Now Vince looked at it, I looked at it separately. He knew even the name of the general giving out the awards, and he knew the number of times it snowed uh, during the winter of 1944-45 in Lucera, Italy. So he knew the significance in the background of all the little details in, a, in an unnarrated film that I had no idea about because I wasn't born yet. Um, and I understand he's going to be called by that person. We were trying to make arrangements so Vince and this other squadron mate can, can talk on the phone. He lives in California, maybe the, the internist. <clears throat> so what was everyday knowledge to you, I guess this is the point, uh, will be quite remarkable to your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. And I know I learned something new <clears throat> every time I come here. Uh, there are a lot of things that never show up in a history book. Uh, Ray Peterson told us about a mission to bomb German submarine pens with a little known top secret uh, rocket propelled uh, bomb called the Disney bomb. And all the problems of getting off of the ground with two enormous bombs which were heavier than the plane was rated for. <clears throat> and Bob Holden uh, said that immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, the crew of the ship he was on went over the side on rope chairs and started painting the ship green instead of white in order to make it harder to spot from the air. Uh, Larry Bachman described his surprise when the new B-24 arrived in England and he discovered it was flown across the Atlantic by two women who had refueled it in Iceland by themselves. And these are all details I've never seen in a history book. And I think it's information that both historians and later family members would be very interested in. <clears throat> I want to point out that the Minnesota Historical Society <clears throat> excuse me, still expends some of their limited financial resources in conducting these old-fashioned videotaped oral history interviews. And the reason for that is because what an eyewitness in history says really matters to historians, and they don't care what an interviewer says, the narrator, the relative, or another historian has to say. When writing contemporary academic history, historians never cite other historians they cite primary sources. So that our interview of uh, Larry was really kind of like an oral history interview, but it was very watchable. It was taped at his home at his dining room table with his photos and documents in front of him. The interview was later shown on television. Uh, Larry was at, that was a cable TV program out in, about in Richfield. I don't have cable, so. Was that a cable program? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, it's, it's a, a, an exemplar of something that we could do that would be broadcast but also preserved uh, with the uh, web hosting um, that video. Now, personally, I like YouTube, which is owned by Google because it's one of the largest companies in the world. It's unlikely to go under any time in the near future, and it's also free. Once video is in digital form and up on YouTube, the information is probably as close to digital immortality as we now know how to do it right now. And it should be available for hundreds of years and available to perhaps hundreds of great, great, great grandchildren who probably will be spread around the globe and its value will increase over time. So to summarize my four points that I want to get across today, um, you all have a lifetime of experience and knowledge. You're not only walking encyclopedias, you're the last remaining primary sources of information about World War II, closest to the period. And what you know is of great value to posterity. You have stories that people don't know and should know because you, you lived it. Second point, many veterans are disappearing before anything is even recorded. I don't have to tell you that, but I just want to point out the statistic. This year, according to the VA, 16 million men and women served in the armed services in World War II, and 1.5 million are still around. My third point is the extended oral history interview is still the preferred method for recording primary source information for archives of historical societies, which is what we are and is preferred for funding by the uh, Minnesota Historical Society. And they're still interested in recording the untold stories of World War II. And finally, or lastly, um, once primary source interviews and period photographs are archived, they're then available to historians uh, and those doing research for documentary films and other secondary works. And um, as an example, we saw last week they reshowed the veterans of Rock County, Minnesota, uh, which was broadcast a series of interviews with World War II veterans. Also, Ken Burns, who you must all know, uh, produced a World War II, II series based almost entirely on primary sources with some interviews of historians. And he based a whole section on archive uh, information from Minnesota. So those are some of my thoughts um, about preservation strategies and the goals for a digital archives. Uh, some of you may have other suggestions or ideas, and we're always open to new ideas here. Um, are there any questions? Otherwise, I'll introduce our, our other speakers. Do you, do you coordinate any of what you do with the uh, Eighth Air Force in Savannah? No, I haven't. I know they do moral history down there also. Yeah. <clears throat> How was Chad Sermon doing with his, his project? I haven't seen it. Well, he, he came and we invited him and he gave a talk. He might have missed that week or something. But he um, hasn't been doing much with it. It's uh, recordings that were made here. And uh, there, I've looked at uh, three of them. Um, they're high quality. Um, they're good technically. Uh, they're about half an hour. I think Dave Dahlberg's was about 45 minutes. Um, Dave Dahlberg was very interesting. I only got to meet the man for about half an hour. But he made an observation which really stuck with me, which was, you know, you can describe to another person in words what your experience was. But unless you actually felt and went through that experience, you really, you're not getting it all. There's a gap there. You know, there's a, a gulf there. And I think that's true not only with World War II people, but just talking to people sitting next to you. You can describe statistically and in words what the experience was, but unless you lived it, you're missing something, a very important thing about it. Was there another question? Yeah. Do you have anything in your history stories about flying the mountain? No. I, I, do you know people that are a source on that? Well, I have a lot of Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. I had a neighbor that was uh, one of the first five people in the Peking. It was called Peking back then. And he was a GI. And, uh, he described coming in there. And he had all these great stories. But one of them was uh, at one time he flew in. And uh, he had a crazy pilot. And the crazy pilot wanted to land the plane on the Great Wall of China. And uh, 